Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to another All Things Avenia. Uh, my name is Eli Travers. I'm your host today. I've always wanted to say that, and I guess technically I'm a host now, a weekly host of, of a, a show. So um, today is our fourth week of doing this type of thing where we get to talk for 45 minutes to an hour about something in the wine industry. And today we're talking about the vineyard. And this is meant to be an overview of some of the basics of a vineyard about the yearly cycle of a vineyard. Um, there is a lot of stuff I'm not gonna cover today because my hope is that throughout the next few months, we'll be able to take different portions of uh, viniculture in, in this whole study and look at them a little more in depth. So this, think of this more as an overview of, of the yearly cycle. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now and we'll just get started right into the presentation. And then we'll of course have time uh, for questions afterwards and to discuss uh, anything you want to talk about. So welcome to the Vineyard 101 or a year in viniculture as well I'll say. Uh, for those of you where the word viniculture is not familiar, uh, it was not familiar to me for a long time too. So let's talk about these crazy long terms that don't make a lot of sense. Uh, what is viticulture, viniculture, and then enology? These are three terms you might find uh, when talking about the more sciencey side of winemaking or grape growing. Uh, and these are the technical definitions. So viticulture with a T is the science study and production of grapes. Uh, and that's just grapes in general. So these could be table grapes, grapes meant for jelly or for juice, just the overall um, grape world. Whereas viniculture, so using an N, is specifically the science study and production of grapes that are turned into wine, so for, for wine purposes. You'll often hear the term viniculture used uh, to refer to winemaking. Um, a lot of times, actually, when I started studying wine, I, I referred to viticulture as grape growing and viniculture with an N as winemaking, but I guess technically that's not true. Whereas enology, or enologies, uh, depending on how you spell it, is more about winemaking, the science of actually winemaking uh, using grapes. So a couple of just terms to start out so we're all on the same page. I'll use viniculture as we go um, move forward, or at least I'll try. I might still say viniculture just because it's ingrained in me, uh, but we're basically talking about uh, the vineyard and what happens before grapes get to the winery. And if you know me by now, I love history, so we'll do a quick little overview of viticulture or viniculture and where it came from. So grape vines were, have been cultivated and then fermented into wine since Neolithic uh, times. So this is between 10,000 BC and 5, 000, 4,000 or 5,000 BC, which is also known as the agricultural revolution. So this is around the same time that humans were converting from their hunter-gatherer days as nomadic people, moving from resource to resource and settling into um, more long-term settlements where they were learning about agriculture, cultivating grain uh, and other plants to use. It's thought that uh, winemaking originated in the Caucasus region, which is where Georgia is, present-day Georgia. At least that's where uh, archaeologists have found traces of winemaking, whether that's um, vessels that had pips, that had grape seeds in them, or other, other sort of um, uh, clues as to what they were doing back then. And um, it, it started, they think it basically started where people were picking grapes because they were delicious, they were sweet, they were a form of calories. If they gathered a bunch of them up into their sack uh, and moved on to the next place, that inevitably some would crush the juice that gathered in the bottom would start fermenting. And they'd drink the juice because why not? It came from those delicious grapes. And then the juice maybe made them feel a little different, made them feel funny because uh, it had started fermenting. Uh, and so they're like, well, let's keep doing this. So they spent the next thousands of years figuring out ways to do that and actually control it. So then by the time we get to the ancient Greeks in 700 BC, um, the cultivation of wine, uh, wine grapes was really spreading. And they're the ones because they were reliant on ships and traveling about the Mediterranean who really spread it throughout that region, throughout Europe. It wasn't until the Romans started figuring things out a little more about how to plant actual vineyards where they would plant vines next to stakes and attach them to stakes in the ground as opposed to just relying on trees or other structures to grow grapes up. Uh, grape vines are natural climbers. They don't, they're not really made to have the kind of structure of a tree or a bush or something that will um, be okay on its own. So it, it needs something to attach to or to climb onto. 
Uh, and the Romans realized they could uh, grow a lot more of them together if they had stakes in the ground and, and let the vines climb on stakes. Uh, Romans also helped uh, spread other technologies and other advancements throughout the empire. And this was between 500 BC and the fall of the Roman Empire, 400 AD. Um, but a lot of what we know about viticulture and viniculture, we can um, give thanks to the monks, actually, the Catholic monks during the Middle Ages. So all throughout France and Germany and different parts of Europe where monasteries popped up, um, you know, monks were some of the only people that a could write <laughs> and were writing and keeping records of things uh, but they studied specifically which grape varieties grew best in which places um, and how things would, would grow well uh, and they in introduced the concept of terroir so the terroir is another uh, term we talk about a lot in the wine industry and let's just sort of think about i hit the wrong button here hmm. there we go uh, about that word terroir. This, like the term sommelier, there's a, a lot of debate in the industry about what terroir means or what it refers to. Uh, and I think it's, it's a good thing to debate because it can reference a lot of different uh, factors. That the general idea of terroir, or this French term terroir, is that it's uh, the sense of place that a wine possesses or expresses. Um, and this can be affected by the factors or properties from a specific region that the vineyard is, or that it hails, or from the vineyard where it's grown. Uh, so those different factors that can affect terroir uh, can be broken down into climate. So this is your average temperature, rain, sunlight, and wind throughout long growing seasons. Your weather, so this is particular to that season in different weather events, whether that be just the normal rain, sunlight, or sunlight and clouds and whatnot, or your extreme events like heat waves, droughts, frost. Uh, site is a, site specificity is, is important with terroir because you have your altitude where you're you're planting your vineyard uh, uh, on a hill. You have your degree of slope, so how steep is the slope where the vineyard's on, and then aspect is super important in a lot of regions, which is saying which direction it's facing. In a lot of the northern hemisphere, the prized spots are south facing slopes because they get a lot more sunlight during the growing season. Um, whereas in a lot of really warm, or at least especially now with wine regions getting hotter and hotter, a lot of times they're now um, actively planting vineyards on the north side or north aspect so that they can have a little less heat and a little less sunlight because they want to control uh, their, their ripening. Soil is a huge part of terroir, not only the type, so this is talking about is it a sand-based, a clay-based, silt, gravel, um, is there volcanic soil? All these things. Um, what, how depth, or what's the depth of that soil? Is it shallow soil? Does it go down really far? Is the bedrock soil different than what the top soil is? The color, um, heat retaining properties, water holding properties, and chemical composition can all affect terroir. Uh, your grapevine, so not only the variety or cultivar that you have, but what sort of rootstock is it grafted onto? Um, which is that you can have a completely separate rootstock from the actual vine that is attached to it. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, trellising, the type of trellising, and row orientation. So if the rows are, you know, directly down a hill slope or maybe they're across a hill slope, and those are to access sunlight at different uh, parts of the day. You have your biotics, which is uh, being more studied, it's more studied now than it ever has been. So this is all the microbial energy and ecology around a vineyard. Um, a lot of it is your fungi and other organisms that are, are mingling with your vines. And those can all affect, uh, they can really affect the final flavor of a wine. Uh, and then of course, disease pressure too. I don't get into disease much in this whole presentation because I think that's, that could be a whole uh, separate topic so there's just so much to talk about in viticulture i'm sorry for the disease and virus fans out there i didn't get really into disease pressure um other inputs like irrigation fertilization compost uh, and then cover crops is a big one planting different plants like legumes or cereal grains or different grasses in between vine rows uh, which can help um, compete with the vines for water and nutrients uh, which can help grapes which can help vines struggle which produces better fruit but it also can be tilled or mowed and help with the soil. Um, and then you have your human elements. This is kind of where I think the definition of terroir gets the most debated is whether the human elements, meaning 
your picking decisions, you know, winemaking choices, is that really part of terroir or is terroir specifically meant to be about the earth and about things about the, the ground um, and on and on. So these are all, there's so many things that can affect terroir that um, I might leave it up to you to also think, yeah, that I don't think that's actually has anything to do with it or, or maybe all of it does. And here's a couple of pictures. So, you know, that first upper left hand picture is a picture of the Hermitage, the hill of Hermitage in the Northern Rhone Valley in France, which you can see is all about slope and aspect. This is a south facing hillside, but then you have parts of the vineyard that are southeast facing, some that are southwest facing, and different degrees of slopes based on where you are on the hill. Uh, on the right side, uh, if you can kind of see it, is Storybrook Vineyard in Napa. So you can see row orientation is interesting there because you have that hill in the background where the vine goes directly down the hill which I think those were Viognier vines. And then the, in the foreground, you have the vines going across the hillside, and I believe those are Zinfandel um, or Cabernet, I forget. I, don't quote me on it. <laughs> but showing that those, those are decisions that need to be made based on the kind of sunlight you might get or water runoff underneath the soil as well. And then this is where you can also see cover crops. They're an organic farming vineyard, so they use um, legumes and vetch and snow, uh, peas and things that they plant in between their vines. Um, to help with soil health. And then the soil there on the bottom is actually from red willow. So this is uh, in Yakima Valley, one of the vineyards we source fruit from. Uh, that's just a little cross section of soil from their vineyard. And where are grapes grown? In general, um, grapes are grown between the 30th and the 50th parallel, both in the northern and southern hemisphere. Um, generally, this is where there's enough sunlight and warmth during the growing season, but also the right cold temperatures during dormancy for the vines to thrive and recover. So these, this is the optimum places of the world where you can grow vines. Um, obviously there's exceptions because we do have places in British Columbia that are above 50 degrees. You have places um, that are in, like Chile and Brazil that are actually above 30 degrees, so Southern Hemisphere. But a lot of times these are, you know, closer to bodies of water where they get, uh, they get their temperature is mitigated through that process or there are higher elevations, particularly in Chile. Um, so the ideal climate, there's three main types of climate or um, categories, of, I guess, that you can, that we talk about in the wine industry. Mediterranean climate, which is your long growing season, moderate to warm temps and a mild and rainy winter. Maritime, like I mentioned, is where you have um, proximity to a large body of water, whether that be an ocean or a sea. Uh, think of Bordeaux. Bordeaux is a maritime climate because it's so close to the Atlantic and that can help mitigate temperatures there. Um, and then continental, which is your more inland climates, which can have hot summers, but then colder winters. And there's definitely a more drastic seasonal shift. And then even more specifically, climate can be divided into three uh, sizes, I guess. You have your macro climate, which can be the climate of the whole state or the whole region, maybe of the whole Appalachian. Think of AVA here in, in the US, um, like Yakima Valley could be a macro climate. And then your meso climate is uh, the climate around a specific vineyard site. So this could be, you know, again, it could be because it's located next to a body of water, like a lake or a pond. Maybe you have a row of cypress trees planted next to the vineyard that protect it from prevailing winds that can affect the mesoclimate of that area. And then microclimates, which is the smallest size of climate, which can literally be um, the canopy climate. So between, between rows or even among one vine, we can talk about microclimate and how sunlight, wind, and rain can, can work uh, on that size. And then real quick, before we get into the year cycle, just want to talk about what types of grapes are we talking about? So the main uh, genus is Vitis. This is the genus of grapevines. There's over 70 different grapevine species. Um, but the main, the main one we talk about is Vinifera, Vitis Vinifera. This is the species of grapevine um, that's native to Europe and Western Asia. So again, think of Georgia, Armenia, those Caucasus Republic, uh, Middle East, um, and then all through Europe. This is your Chardonnay, your Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Syrah. All these are Vitis vinifera uh, varieties um, or cultivars. And there's a lot. There's almost 8,000 different cultivars just within this one species of vine. But only about 1,300 are used commercially to make wine. So again, thinking about next week when we do our new varietal support group. So if you wanted to, for our, for our next 
uh, all things video session. Um, there's 1300 different grapes out there. I hope you can find a grape you've never tried before and then grab that wine and come and join us because we'll be able to, to explore some more strange grapes. Uh, two other vines that are important, Vitis Labrusca and Vitis Riparia, both indigenous to North America. Um, Labrusca, you'll recognize because Concord grapes are this um, species of vine or species of grape, but also Niagara, Catawba. These have been used to make wine in the past, but the wine isn't that great. And part of it is because they tend to have this earthy, musky aroma, uh, which actually caused the early settlers and people who discovered these vines to refer to them as fox or foxy. Um, but they are used in a lot of hybrids. So hybrids are uh, when you cross a Vitis labrusca or different species of vine, uh, of grapevine with Vitis vinifera. And there's reasons to do that. A lot of cooler climate growing regions, like the, region, the reason we can grow grapevines in Vermont and in Canada and a lot of places that are a little too far north or maybe a little too cold for a lot of Vitis vinifera varieties, you can cross them with other um, species of vines and to give them some of those capabilities to, to withstand colder weather. And then Vitis riparia is uh, particularly important because of its rootstock. So again, a lot of times you can, actually most of the time, Vitis vinifera vines are grafted onto rootstock of riparia or a couple other different um, native North American rootstock vines um, because it helps prevent or helps protect the vine from pests and diseases. Uh, the big disease, you know, to do of the last few hundred years was phylloxera. This was a, a root louse, a pest that just decimated vineyards in France and all of Europe in the late 1800s. And it took scientists a little while, but they realized that if they took rootstock from the, the vines that were native to North America, because phylloxera came from North America originally, those rootstocks already found a way to be resistant. They evolved or they, they developed resistance to that specific pest. And so they realized if they just took rootstock from those North American vines, grafted the European vines onto it, that those, those grapes that, and those grapes and vineyards that produced grapes for wine were protected from phylloxera. And it was, it didn't necessarily change it didn't change the eventual grapes into a, a, a riparia or a North American grape, um, but it, there is a chance that that can affect certain um, capabilities of, you know, like I said, disease pressure, but also um, climate, ways to mitigate climate pressure and uh, erosion. There's lots, lots of things that having different rootstock can help that plant be more fruitful. So a year in the vineyard, you don't have to worry about this too much because I know the words are kind of small, even for me, I'm looking right at it and it's hard to, to read. But the idea that this, we're going to talk about sort of what happens in each part of the year. And we'll start with what's happening right now, which is pruning, pruning and training. So over the winter, the, the, wine, the vine has gone dormant, so there's, it's not growing any new growth. And what you have left over from last year's harvest is a lot of canes and a lot of debris and wood and, and things in the way. And so an essential part of renewing the vine in this, in this period between December and February uh, is, is pruning and chaining. So we have to cut away a lot of what was there from the, from the previous harvest, but we have to set up what's going to happen in the upcoming season. And some things that you're doing in setting this up by pruning is you're uh, figuring out how much crop to expect. So what you end up leaving on the vine um, will result in buds, how many buds you have on the vines, which out of each bud grows a shoot. And out of each shoot, you can expect there to be two clusters of grapes. Um, sometimes it will only be one, sometimes three, but in general, you shoot for about two clusters of grapes on each shoot. So already when you do pruning and training, you're deciding how much fruit you're hoping to get in that vineyard. Um, you can also, this is where you decide where those leaves and those shoots are growing. Um, which will also tell you the position and maybe the height of the fruit zone. So this is where those grape clusters will eventually hang. Um, and then not only that, you're also making decisions about the eventual crop for the following season because the bud, a grape bud, is a two-year cycle. So as, as soon as you have a shoot grow and they grow leaves and they grow tendrils and flowering buds, there's also what buds will start growing that one year um, that won't ask, they won't actually be ready to make a new shoot until the following year. They need to go dormant for one season, and then out after that next dormancy is when they'll shoot up to create new fruit. Um, two different training methods. You have your head trained. Um, again, we, we'll probably do, I'll probably do something 
in the future about training and pruning because it can get really complicated but also really fascinating but in these are sort of the the main points you have your head trained and cordon trained methods of of vine training uh, head train is where you leave your trunk and you have the shoots grow directly out of the trunk um, this can be um, this can be you can have different types of styles based on where you are and what works best um, but head trained and then cordon trained which is where shoots will grow out of a permanent arm this is closer to the bottom picture in the in the screen and then pruning styles you have cane pruning um, and spur pruning. Cane pruning means you just leave one cane, which is a shoot from the previous year. You leave that cane where shoots will grow out of. Uh, and then spur pruning, where you leave a spur, which is just a little miniature cane with a couple different buds on it. Um, and the cane pruning is more common in cooler climates because you have a little more frost protection, whereas sp spur pruning is a little more common in warmer climates. Um, these are just a couple examples. So the one on the far left is, this is the Zinfandel. So this is a bush trained vine, also known as goblet, which is a head train, so it's that trunk and spur prune. So you don't see those canes coming off of it. Um, they're just left with some little buds there that are waiting for, for growth. Um, in the middle, you have your head trained cane pruned. So these are actually Pinot Noir vines in Sonoma, where you have your trunk and then they have a cane. This is actually a double guillo, so it has two canes split out from the, the, the center. Um, and you'll have your shoots grow off of those canes. Uh, and then on the right, I forget what type of vine this is, but I know it was in Napa, and that's your cordon train. So this is where you have a, a cordon. So that used to be a single cane, but over time it's hardened uh, into an arm similar to a trunk, and you have your, your spurs on top of that. Um, in January and February, this is also the time to do your maintenance in your vineyard. So after you go through and prune your vineyard, you have all these canes, all this debris left over in between. Um, there's different ways to deal with it. Sometimes you can just go through and collect it, have it composted, and then spread it back into the vineyard to reintroduce some of those microorganisms. You can actually run a tractor with a flail mower. Basically, it's a, it scoops up everything, mulches it into small pieces, and it leaves it there in the vineyard, and those, those will break down over time. And then it used to be a lot more common, but not as much. You can actually collect them and burn them. Uh, near the end of the presentation, I actually have a picture. We were in Burgundy when they were doing just that. They were going through with a little wheelbarrow, and they would, burn, they would be pruning, and then they'd toss them in, and they'd be burning uh, all the way through walking through the vineyard. And uh, trellises, this is also when you would just do infrastructure. So make sure all of your trellises, your wires, stakes are all tight, anchored, repaired, and ready for the next season. So then we get into the growing season. So March or April, when average temperatures reach 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is your 10 degrees Celsius, uh, those dormant buds will burst with growth and you'll start getting leaves, tendrils, shoots. Um, and the, the buds will grow into shoots. Um, and again, like I said, they'll have next year's buds on the shoot as well. So it's that two year growing cycle. And at this point, you're gonna get a lot of you're going to get a lot of growth all over the vine. So sometimes on the trunk, sometimes if it's cordon trained, you'll have it all on different sides of the cordon. Um, so a, what's equally important when bud break happens is to, to sucker or to go through and do a suckering, which you're removing less dominant shoots, you're removing some other vegetative growth, some leaves. And this helps maintain vine balance and it concentrates the energy on those growing shoots, the one that you really want to get clusters from. Uh, this also is where you can help style the canopy or the initial uh, position of the canopy as it grows. And then we get to May through June. So when average temperatures reach 68 degrees or 20 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, Celsius, um, you have flowering. So the grapevines in general, most grapevines, most species of grapevines are hermaphrodites, which means they self-pollinate. So we don't need bees. You don't necessarily need something else or different vines next to each other that will help to pollinate them, that they, they'll pollinate on themselves. So they will flower on themselves, well, by themselves. And this occurs usually five to 10 weeks. I read somewhere it was three to eight weeks and somewhere it said six to 13. So I'm gonna say five to 10 weeks after budding is when flowering occurs. Um, and this is really a crucial time for the vine because um, for every flower you have, that's gonna turn into uh, fruits, which will turn into your berry and your grape. So it's really important to make sure that flowering uh, is successful. So this is when 
it's the most susceptible to damage from cold, frost, wind, rain events. Um, and so it's, I know it's, it's always a pretty nerve wracking time for, for growers, for vintners, because, um, because flowering is so crucial. Um, but like suckering in the last slide, we have people that will go through and trim at this point too. So like suckering, you're removing unwanted growth. So if you have um, a cluster that looks like it's already shot or there's not great flowers produced or you have too many clusters, like it looks like you're gonna have too many clusters on that vine, you'll go through and start trimming off different shoots and different um, clusters to help concentrate energy into the fruiting uh, parts of the vine. And then we get to June, July-ish when fruit starts setting. So this is exciting because now um, each bloom, like I said, will turn into a berry, but these are really small, hard green fruit. This is the very beginning of that grape ripening process. And really only about 30 to 50% of flowers will turn into berries. Um, two of those issues, so from flowering, with, all, with, with rain, with frost, with all these events that could affect flowering, two of the things that will happen is coulure and millerandage. Coulure or shattering is when the flowering fails to develop into those fruit, into fruit set. Um, from things like wind and rain and those clusters can fall off and there's there's certain varieties or cultivars that are more susceptible to this issue Grenache being one of them Merlot two grapes we work with a lot and then Muron Dodge um, which is where you have uneven ripening so maybe you have a cluster where all the flowers looked good at first but then you had some flowers blow off from the cluster others were doing just fine you had fruit set at different times maybe because of temperature or weather events and so you get uneven ripening in the same cluster. This affects things like Zinfandel, Champs Grenache. Both of these things though, they aren't necessarily bad for the wine. So when you taste a wine at the end, at the end of the process, if, if those vines went through Millerandage or had Coulure or anything, um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna hurt the wine. It'll basically just change the amount of yield you have. You just might have less grapes or less concentration. And Millerandage actually can sometimes be a favorable uh, you can get favorable results from it. For, for instance, I love Zinfandel and Grenache because it has that uneven ripening. And what it does in the wine is you could have grapes on the same cluster that get really ripe, almost raisinated, because they, they, they ripen a little earlier and they start to shrivel. Where on the same cluster, you might have berries that didn't get ripe enough and might still have a lot of more acid or more, more tartness. But when you make wine with those clusters, you can get a those sensations in the taste. You might taste a Grenache that has sort of a dried raisiny fig flavor, but also have a really tart cranberry or tart raspberry flavor. And a lot of it can be because you had those une uneven ripening from Milleron Dodge. So it's, it's not terrible, but it can definitely affect the way that the wine will taste at the end of the day. And then thinning, like suckering and trimming, is just another opportunity to go through uh, and to see if there's anything maybe you missed a vine that ended up having too many clusters. This is another chance to, to thin the clusters out of the way to concentrate energy. And then in late July, early August, you get to Veraison, or I always said Veraison. It's definitely not Veraison. It's a French word. So I think it's Veraison. And this is your, this is the point in the grapevine's life where you start turning from hard green grapes into purple, red, pink, or yellow or translucent green for white grapes. Um, this happens about six weeks after fruit set, you know, give or take, depending on where you are, climate, all the other um, factors. Um, and this is where the vine turns from energy creation or photosynthesis into all the, the greenery that it's trying to produce. And then it turns that into energy consumption and moves sugar from the leaves into the fruits. So two, two things are happening at the same time. You have your berries are ripening and concentrating in sugar and, and ripening acid and phenolics and lots of things. Whereas this, the stems are getting lignified, they're losing oh, some of their energy. Uh, anthocyanins, like I said, in polyphenols or tannins um, are accumulating in the skins. Um, this is also when seeds start to reach ripeness. It's funny, if you think about grapevines in general, the reason, the evolutionary reason why grapevines turn pretty colors like purple or pink is also to attract birds because for a long time, the only way a grapevine could reproduce is by spreading its seed. And so in order to attract birds to come and eat the grapes and then carry that seed somewhere else, they had to make the grapes really attractive. So they made them sweet, they made them colorful, bright. Uh, and so it's sort of, it's the way that the vine developed over a long, or over millennia um, 
And it just so happens that that's how we can tell that a grape is going to be delicious and how, why we want to make it into wine. I just think that's fascinating. And then again, like suckering, trimming, thinning, we have green harvesting. So um, when this process of raisin is happening, you can walk through the vineyard again. And this is not another opportunity to drop clusters that might be a little behind schedule. Um, that you know that won't if the vine has too many clusters and a couple of them are still green and aren't, aren't really getting there, you'll want to get those those clusters out of the way so that the vine just puts all of its energy into those remaining clusters and make those as ripe and beautiful as possible. And then harvest. So anywhere from August to October. By the way, this is all northern hemisphere. I, I should have said at the beginning, <laughs> if you're making wine in the southern hemisphere, just Take it six months uh, the other way, the other direction. So harvest in, in the Southern Hemisphere, you're talking about February, March. You're not talking about August, October. This is all Northern Hemisphere because that's where we are. So about 30 to 70 days after Verizon, depending on grape t uh, variety and, and many other factors, the grapes will reach maturity. And so it's ready to pick. Uh, but lots of, thing, lots of factors will affect picking decisions. Um, you're looking for ripeness level. So this is what's measured in bricks or degrees of bricks usually between you know, 19 and, and 25, 26 bricks are your sugar levels you're looking for in harvesting grapes for wine. But you're also looking for ripeness of phenolics or tannin. There's a P, the acidity or pH balance. You wanna make sure the seeds are lignified, that they're not green or that they would have too high levels of pyrazine, which is that it can be that really green bell peppery flavor that sometimes you don't want in wines. You don't really want it in wines. And then this is where the winemaker really comes in. I know that Chris, our winemaker during harvest is going back and forth to the vineyards we source from every week for, for a good three, four weeks to keep a really close eye, tasting grapes, doing passes through the vineyard to make sure that not only are they at the right sugar level, but they just taste good and that they're, that are, they're at a place where they'll have the right amount of acid and, and, uh, and tannin to, to make great wine. Our, for Chris is an earlier picker, so he likes to pick on the earlier side of ripeness where you might have wineries or winemakers that decide they like a little more robust wines or a little boozier wines, so they might wait and leave the hang time a little more to, to concentrate a little more sugar. But then there's even there's logistical issues with harvest. Um, you need to make sure that there's actually a picking crew available. If you're picking by hand, which a lot of vineyards, all the vineyards we work with are picked by hand, but there's certain parts of the world where they do use mechanical harvesting or, or tractors, uh, which can be great because um, it can be quick process if you're trying to race the clock before rain or some other event. Um, but making sure you have a picking crew available, making sure you have fruit thins at the vineyard so that they actually have places to put all of your grapes into. And this is also like flowering, this is one of the main uh, places in the vineyard year where weather can really be great or detrimental. So rain uh, during harvest uh, is, is bad for lots of reasons, but mainly because it swells the berries. The vines, is, with fresh rain, the vines will soak up that water and the berries will, will swell with water and it dilutes them. And so if it does rain, you want to wait a few days after that to, to make sure that the grapes aren't just expanded with, with, with water, which will, won't taste great. Um, and so you might have to work around that kind of a schedule. Um, a lot of times harvesting will happen in the early hours of the morning or overnight to keep uh, temperatures really cold. You also wanna make sure the fruit stays as cold as possible through the whole process to avoid oxidation or just to prevent rot or other things happening um, or for certain bacteria from getting in there. But yeah, so harvest, you know, it's, it's the most exciting time of the year or of the yearly cycle for, for winemakers, but it's also sometimes the most nerve wracking because there's just a lot of decisions will come down to the last minute. And then when we get to post harvest, by the time you get back into the vineyard, so between September and December, there's lots of decisions. There's this whole debate about plowing. So there's competing thoughts uh, as to whether it's important to do this is plowing in between vines. Some of the arguments uh, is that it helps to create mounds around the base of the vine. This is a, a practice called butage, which can insulate and help protect the vines, if, especially if it's in a colder climate area where you might have a really harsh winter. They also argue that it mixes the organic material. So you have this sort of natural mulching and that some people even think it cuts lateral roots, which might encourage the roots of the grape to dig deeper. 
Um, there's still, I don't know if there's a lot of truth behind that because <laughs> there's, it depends on the rootstock, depends on the variety, depends on the soil about how your root structure is actually developing in the first place. And then other arguments against it is that um, soil doesn't necessarily need to be turned to develop. You can use cover crops, worms, there's other, other organic material that can help till the soil. You can, there's lots of radishes or certain plants you can, you can use to aerate soil and, and do that. Um, and then especially if you're on a slope, plowing can cause erosion, which is not great for a vineyard. You really still wanna have those vines secure and, and, and safe. And then after that, we're back to pruning. So this is that picture. When we were in uh, Burgundy, this was two years ago, I think, there was this guy going through and you can see all those, those crazy cut, those crazy canes um, going through pruning, cutting, and then just burning them right there in this little wheelbarrow. Um, so that you can see on the picture on the right, he's already done the rows close or to the right side of the picture where he's still working on the ones on the left. I just thought it was interesting that they still do that. And a lot, especially in Burgundy, they tend to uh, be very traditional and will do things the way that they've been doing them for hundreds of years. But that is it. So that is a year in the vineyard. I know that that's a lot of information and it is... Um, there's a lot of information I left out, a lot of stuff that we uh, didn't get to talk about, which I hope um, we'll, we'll talk about that eventually. But I uh, wanted to open it up, see if you had any questions about what we talked about, or just what kind of things you're interested in learning more about when it comes to viniculture, when it comes to vineyard. Um, my hope is also that when we do other um, discussions on vineyard um, specific things that I'll be able to actually have um, one of our growers or someone that works in our vineyard be here to help answer questions also because I think it would be cool to have some some people with a lot more knowledge about it than myself. Um, but if any of you do have any questions, uh, now would be a time to, to ask. Yeah, Renee. If you could plant a vineyard anywhere in the world, money, distance, not a problem, based on viniculture and your personal taste, where would it be? That's a good question. I think, well, honestly, I'd be looking at more Northern climates. I think, especially just knowing, just thinking about um, climate change and about what's happening in the world as far as um, it's getting harder and harder to grow grapes <laughs> the further south or the further or the closer to the equator you get. Um, but also the kinds of wines I enjoy are lower alcohol um, wines and food friendly wines. So. Riesling, you know, Chenin Blanc, like Chard cool climate Chardonnay for whites, and then like Cabernet Franc, Gamay Noir, things in certain Pinot Noir, certain those cool climate red grapes. So I would even think something like Niagara, like in Canada or upstate New York, like Finger Lakes, I think would be a really interesting place to to plant a vineyard. Um, yeah, that's probably where I would go. I, but but you're right, I don't have enough money to do it, so. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, I noticed earlier in one of your pictures that uh, the slope was pretty steep. Yeah. I also noticed there was a lot of grass in between the uh, rows. Uh, is that grass primarily to uh, uh, ameliorate erosion? Yeah, it is. And there's actually, there's a lot of wine, um, growers who mm -hmm. insist on keeping the grass in between vines because of erosion, but also because of kind of a permaculture um, theory. So the idea that you want to just keep the kinds of plants and and grasses that were norm that are naturally in that place to stay there, um, as opposed to like, doing different cover crops. But especially on on slopes, on steeper slopes, um, grass or different plants in between is is crucial because you want to make sure that you're not going to have any slides in rain events. Because a lot of times those rain events are also happening in the winter. So in um, other times where there's not as much growth, there's not as much green growth or really active root structures in the, on the hillside. Um, so yeah, the more, the more plants, I think the better. A lot of the places, and it, but again, it depends on the soil type there too. Cause you know, in the Northern Rhone, they're, they're very uh, granitic. There's a lot of granite and there's a lot of um, the schist, like a mica schist soil and, and things that, can, that actually are pretty crumbly and pretty um, scary. And so 
they instead of relying on cover crops they, they basically just use stakes so they'll, they'll use huge stakes in the ground for each vine uh and they'll use terracing so they'll actually build you know walls or or barriers into the hillside to make steps to plant vines on because they don't want to try to even plant on that steep slope so but there's yeah it's there's lots of different ways to do it but um everyone has their own personal reason for it as well i would imagine then that uh plowing between the rows of vines uh, would only be used during rel on relatively flat land. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, and I'll double check, I'll do a little more because I, I did a little research on plowing and, and again, there is a big debate on whether it's even necessary at all, but it's, it's one of the few things that people will actually still do in their vineyard in that time period in the year. <laughs> a lot of times, as soon as harvest is done, people are like, all right, I'm getting out of here for a month and they don't do anything in the vineyard and they'll come back and just prune. Um, but I'll, I'll look more into that. That's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. There you go. Eli, how, how old, how long do vines last? How many years do they, and do you have to replant? So what, what's the ages of vines? Great question. So um, again, a lot of it can depend on site, on specific site, but in general, when you plant a vineyard from cutting, so when you plant that initial cutting, um, the first time you'll actually get fruit off of it that you can produce wine from is the third leaf or the third season. Um, so already when you plant a vineyard, and this is why, going back to Renee's question, why you need a lot of money to, to plant a vineyard is because when you make the decision to plant a vineyard, you're not even going to start seeing produce or product from that until three years later. Um, so around the third year, you get your first fruit. It's still considered young. The vines are still considered young. Um, usually by the seventh year, so seven years in, is considered mature. Um, but and and but but between seven and about twenty years of age is its prime uh, grape producing time. After twenty years, um, depending on the variety, again on the variety, the climate, where you are, the vine will will start to um, produce lower and lower yields, so you won't get as much fruit. And so usually by, um, or sorry, no, I think it's 12, 12, 12 to 20 is it starts, it starts declining. Usually after 20 years, um, a decision needs to be made. Is it still viable, economically viable to keep this vineyard going? Because you might be getting a lot less yields or a lot less fruit from it than you used to when they were seven years old. Um, and then it comes down to, you know, does the person who owns the vineyard have enough capital to keep it going? Because maybe the grapes are, are fantastic. They've gotten wine, beautiful wines. They've gotten great scores. And it's a really, it's an amazing vineyard that everyone wants wine from. You'll try to keep those vines as long as possible, even though you might not make a lot of wine from it. Um, or you might decide, yep, you know what? These vines have, are a little, they're lower yields. They, maybe they have some disease or pest issues like, um, like leaf roll disease or red blotch. There's certain things that will they make the vine lower yield, but not necessarily affect the flavor of wines, but it just, it makes it less economical to keep it going. Um, but the exceptions to there are you can, you can also have vines that are over 100 years old um, and still produce grapes. There's certain parts of the world like Zinfandel and different places in California, the Sierra foothills, where you still have vines that were planted back uh, before prohibition that are still producing um, grapes that can be made into the wine. Uh, and then another famous place where old vines are a thing is Australia, specifically in Barossa Valley in, in South Australia. They actually have developed a, a labeling or sort of a naming um, law or it's not a law, but it's a labeling designation where you can label uh, older vines. I th and I'll, to, I'll double check and I'll make sure I put it in the, the fact check, but I think it has to be at least 35 years of age to be considered old vine. And then there's a uh, 50 year old or at 75 year olds are considered um ah, i forget the name of it uh, and i don't want to misspeak because it's, it's pretty cool there's like an ancient vine there's centennial vine if it's 100 years old but you have vines there that are 130 years old i think the oldest vine in the world that's still producing is something like 400 years old um so vines can they can left, definitely last a very very long time but as far as the economy of a vineyard and if you're if you're looking to make sure that you're getting your money's worth most vineyards don't last past i would say 30 years 30 40 years yeah yeah mary margaret 
so it's it's your description there's like a million decisions that need to be made and and i'm uh, you get grapes from different vineyards correct yeah so what kind of dialogue do does avenia have with its different growers about all of these decisions how much of it is a dialogue or is that all in the hands of the of the you know person growing the grapes that's a great question cuz and I, and I'll, I'll talk to Chris and follow up because I know that there's, we do communicate a lot with our growers um, about certain desires we might have. The way that vineyard contracts work is that we actually, we know exactly which rows of vines are ours in some, in some, in some vineyards, which vines we are sort of our vines. And a lot of, there'll even be little signs. Like if you go to Red Willow in Yakima, there's posts that say Avenia on them, or there's posts that say, you know, other other wineries that get fruit from them. And so it, there might be more communication between Chris and, and the owners, say, of Red Willow earlier in the season about things like maybe green harvesting, you know, positioning, canopy management. But at the same time, I know that we also have all the trust in the world with our growers that we, we were, we're really lucky that we get to work with some of the best growers in the state. And so we know that they're doing their best to 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 manage their vineyards, to deal with any weather events, any pest or disease issues. Um, and, and, and it's usually not until, like I said, usually closer to harvest where Chris is going out there pretty often um, to keep a closer eye and, and to test grapes and, and not only send them to the lab for analysis, but also tasting grapes um, to, to you know, decide when to pick and, and things like that. But, but as far as new vineyards, you know, the, the one place where I think Chris, where not that we have a little more say because it's a whole new project, but uh, our new liminal project, which is a uh, a wine that we just or a, a brand that we just created that's specifically geared towards one vineyard called Weather Eye Vineyard on the top of Red Mountain, uh, and that has some really interesting vineyards that are different aspects, different slopes. There's some north facing things. Um, and Ryan Johnson is the, is the plant, the guy who planted those vineyards, but I know that Chris and Ryan have a really good relationship too. And, and, um, they talk a lot about, about positioning, about, you know, spacing density. There's so, there's so many decisions. Um, and I, but I'll, I'm not positive how much Chris is, is involved in those decisions, or if it's more about after the fact and, and sort of rolling with the, with the punches as, as they say. So, but I'll find out. That's, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, Renee and then Logan. That's I'm Renee. so sorry. I have another question. Um, based on like vineyard conditions or age of vines, does anything with the vineyard contribute to the ultimate price of a wine that may, like, because the vineyard is where it is or the vines are old or what have you, this is a super expensive bottle of wine or a super cheap bottle of wine. Yeah, it, price is, you know, price is so tricky in the industry because because it can be affected by so many things. With vineyard, I think with vineyard, uh, specifically, it's a lot of it is about how expensive is that land. Like if you're planting a vineyard in Napa Valley, that land price is pretty expensive in the first place. So you're going to want to charge a little more for those grapes, which inevitably might make you charge more for the wine. But wine, wine cost, you know, it's it's a, a combination of everything that goes into wine. So it's the the bottling, so the glassware, labels, capsules. It's the oak, like when we talked about oak barrels and how expensive were the oak barrels you're using on this wine. It's your your facility, your your um, presses, your all of your equipment. It's you know your your staff, your your people that you you paid to to make your wine or to represent your wine, and then you're paying yeah the fee for the grapes. But you know there's going to be vineyards that end up having a little more cachet, I think, and part of that is is not only they produce grape fruit or maybe they have some older vines or some really unique um, aspects or unique parts about the specific vineyard, but it also maybe um, lasts the test of time where you have, you've had so many great, you know, I'd say Boucher Vineyard is one of them. We work with Boucher Vineyard uh, and sometimes those wines from Boucher can be more expensive, but it's because people know Dick Boucher grows some of the best grapes in the state because he's had year after year after year of great, great um, vintages. So. So I think it's a combination of a lot of those factors. Thank you. Logan. Uh, kind of a two-part question. 
whether you cane prune or crown prune a vine, does it, it how dependent is it upon the variety? And also what does it do? Is there a difference into the longevity of the vine as to how you prune it? That's a great question. Um, I know that there, there's there's definitely varietal varieties that uh, perform better with a certain training or a certain pruning method. Um, and part and part of it, I think, is just about you know there's certain varieties, or if you're in a certain climate where you need um, a larger canopy. Say you're in a really hot climate and you need more protection. So you you want to have more leaf growth, more shoot growth to have this a more protected uh, shade environment for your grapes because you're worried about them getting sunburnt or getting ripe too fast. Um, so you might train or prune in a different way that creates a canopy for, for that reason. Although you also in cooler climates where you might struggle to get ripeness, you might need to um, you might need to prune and set up your vine or train your vine in a way where you get more dappled or speckled lights. So dappled light is sort of the, the optimal um, light that gives you ripeness when you want fruit to, to develop um, at a good rate, not too fast, not too slow. Um, but you might, you know, different varieties have different vigor levels too. So just have a nat are naturally more vigorous or grow a little more easily in general because of what variety it is. So you'll have to take that into consideration with, with pruning and, and training. Um, it's 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 crazy. I mean, there's a reason that they have people who just study uh, grape vines and and, and do this because there's a lot that goes into those decisions. And I think um, I think I hope I've answered your question kind of. But but I was just going back to canopy. Um, the other reason to there's certain grapes like when we talked about Milron Dodge, so Grenache, which tends to ripen uneasily, you might choose um, a different training method, like these bush vines, the goblet style vines, which are the trunk. Which you find it. A lot of times those are trained in a way where the fruit gets to hang low to soil that actually retains heat and reflects heat up onto the grapes at night because it does need help ripening. So there's just, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of factors. <laughs> so. And that's I, I was gonna say pruning pruning and training I think could be a whole another discussion because there's there's a lot more to it and and there's a lot more that I don't know about it yet that I need to learn. So, do they ever, um, as far as trying to get sun to the grapes for ripening, do they ever take leaves off of the uh, vines in mid season to try and help the grapes ripen? Yeah, there's there's a couple different. The, they, sometimes they just call it leafing, where they will go through and, and pluck leaves, or they'll do hedging. So it's the same idea where they, they'll trim both the sides of, of, of um, the canopy or the top, and that's to do the same thing. That's either to create more space for light to come through because maybe they've had trouble ripening that season, so they need, they need more light. Um, but yeah, there, there's other, other ways to go <clears throat> at different points in the season to make sure you're getting enough um, light and heat. Yeah. Yeah, Faith, did you have a question? Yes. Um, you were saying that sometimes you pick during the evenings to uh, to maintain the acidity in a grape. Mm -hmm. How is it? How do that? How is it that acid levels would change between night and day? It's a good question. And even when I said that, I was like, you know what? I hope I'm right about this, and I'm gonna look into it because because I know that they. Um, I. It might not be that it's it's uh, as important for retaining a city in the actual grape. I do think, especially if it's a warm, if harvest, say it's October and we have a heat wave, and but because especially in Washington we have that diurnal shift where it gets really cold at night and really hot during the days, um, that you still do get accumulation of sugar during those days each day. I know that we've we've gotten bricks measurements um, in like the last week before we pick. And it might go from 22 bricks and the next day it's 23 and then and two days after that it's 24 bricks and it it accumulates sugar a lot quicker and sometimes when it's accumulating sugar it's also losing acid so i think there is there is something about keeping um acidity from ripening too much because you basically because you don't want it to get hot again <laughs> like if, if it gets hot one more day it might lose a little bit of acid but i think more more importantly, it's more about keeping the grapes cold throughout the whole process. Um, because we, even when we get grapes in the winery, you wanna keep them cold um, to, to prevent 
um, per, to prevent it from starting to ferment or just starting to, to grow anything. I, I'm sure there's like bacteria reasons I'm not thinking about or don't understand yet that I'll, that I'll find out. In, but that's, that's a good question. And I'll make sure to, um, to look up more reasons why that's, that's done or why it's important and put it in the, the fact check. Good question. Peter. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, question. Uh, I've, I've heard it said, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but uh, the French accuse the Washington State wine uh, industry as manufacturing their wine because we're so dependent on irrigation hmm. and less on climate. Uh, is that really a valid criticism uh, or how, how, would the, how would the Washington wine industry react to such a statement? Yeah, I mean, I think it's funny because there's definitely there's areas in France where they also have to irrigate or where they do irrigate. Okay, um, it's pretty. You know, part of it is there's very few places, very few places in Washington where you don't have to irrigate. I think Columbia Gorge. There's some there's some areas where they get enough rainfall or they get enough where, where they they can do dry what's considered dry farming, um, but it's not very common because most of our vines um, are grown in the desert in the eastern Washington semi-arid desert i guess the other right. two, puget sound there are there are vineyards in puget sound ava that can probably rely on, on not irrigating because we get enough water in, in seattle so um but as far as you know french why may or that that debate i think at this point especially with washington having made such great wines over the last decade or two um it's getting harder to refer to washington wines as sort of subpar i think or or not being able to hold up to Mm -hmm. European wines. Um, yeah, I, I don't see I don't see the that argument going very far. Um, part, right. Obviously, we're biased because we love Washington wine and <laughs> I work for Washington wine. But I also love French wine. And you know, Chris and Marty, our our winemaker and partner, um, are huge fans of French wines. And they they are there are definitely some French wines that um, that are dry farmed that are gorgeous and have a lot of terroir and you you have this sense of place um but you know what there's a lot of places in france that also will use some irrigation so okay yeah. thank you well that was great thanks um for all those questions there's obviously there's a lot of uh, other topics we can get into from viniculture in general i'm excited to to sit down and sort of plan out what we might get to talk about in the coming months um, like pruning or disease control or, or temperature, climate. There's lots, lots of great stuff here. Uh, but it is, it's 5.32, so we've been going about an hour. I think it might be a good place to, to, to say good night and have you all enjoy your dinner and everything. Um, a little plug for next week. Also, I, I said it before, next week is New Varietal Support Group. So what we're doing is we're encouraging everyone to try, just go out, get a wine that you've never had before. If you've never tried Roussan, Marsan blends, Go ahead, get a bottle of La Pearl from Avenia uh, and open that up and we can talk about it. So maybe you're a red wine drinker and you just hate white wines. Get a Chardonnay or a Riesling and just open it up and see what happens. It's a support group, not only because we get to try new things, but also if you feel like, I just don't like this grape and I don't know why, we're going to be here for you. We can talk about it. I would love to hear from more people next week too about their experience tasting some weird wines. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to find a wine I've never tried before so that we can do it together. Uh, and then we can also, it'll be good for me to, to learn something new about different varieties. So, so I hope you'll join me next week. Um, but last thing I'd love to do, if you do want to unmute just to say goodbye, we could do that. And that way we can send you off into your snowy weekend if you're in the Northwest. Actually, there's snow everywhere, but, but anyway, thank you so much. It was great to see you all. Bye, Eli, you're the best. Bye. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.